I think Jem was talking earlier and he said that there are people who like to plan and people who like to just wing it. And I'm definitely a planner. Um, so I have a little agenda for what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I'd just like to lay that out before we get started. Um, so we're gonna talk about what is accessibility. I think it's something that we don't do a very good job of defining at the outset before we dive into it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're gonna talk about some examples from the physical world to kind of use as um, analogies for the digital world. And then I wanna talk about the users a little bit. Um, you know, I'm essentially a user experience person and I think it's really important to always focus on users and think about what users wanna do and what they need to get done, regardless of what technology they're using or what abilities they have. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the range of users. And then I also wanna introduce the idea of assistive technology. It's pretty important when you're talking about accessibility um, to talk about the technologies that people are using to access the web. So we'll just do a brief introduction to that and I'll try to do some demos of voiceover software looking at a website. Um, then we're gonna dive into the accessibility standards um, and that tends to be the most conf confusing part of accessibility. Um, I know the standards can be a little bit daunting. Um, I always feel when I talk about accessibility that you know, we, we all agree that we wanna make websites accessible. And we all know why accessibility is important. But then it seems to me that we agree up here about that and then we go so far deep into code details that we miss what's in the middle. Um, and we don't get to gradually get into those details of what's important about the code. And I think a lot of us get overwhelmed. I'm not really a code person myself. And so it's easy to get very overwhelmed by success criteria and compliance and things like that. So I'm gonna try to introduce the standards in what I like to think of as a usable way um, so that they'll be a little bit more understandable. Um, and then I just wanna say a few words about Drupal and accessibility and talk about um, what you can do next when you leave here, the things to keep in mind and how you can move forward with making your websites accessible. Um, I also have a slide with a lot of resources and tools on it that I think will be useful to folks um, moving forward. So let's see. So first of all, what is accessibility? Um, I like to start with the Merriam-Webster definition of accessibility just as a good place to start. They define accessible as capable of being reached, capable of being used, and capable of being understood or appreciated. Um, and I, I like that definition actually because it talks a lot about things being used, right? We're not talking about um, compliance and litigation and things like that. I had a side conversation earlier with someone about that trying to define accessibility. And I really don't like to define accessibility in terms of um, litigation and you know, am I compliant or am I not compliant? Because accessibility is really a continuum and I don't think you'll ever find anyone who's 100% compliant all the time. Okay, so what I wanted to do is start with some examples from the physical world. Um, for those of you from the Boston area, who has ridden the Green Line? Okay, so I spend a lot of time on the Green Line, and we all know that the Green Line has steps on every train to get on. And if you have difficulty walking, getting on the Green Line can be really difficult. So this is a picture of what the accommodation is for the MBTA on the Green Line. It's a lift that is used to get people from the platform, the above ground platform, up onto the train. Um, it works, it gets, you, it gets people where they need to go. Um, I would probably say it's not the best user experience possible because you have to arrange for this ahead of time. Um, I think it takes a separate operator to actually get you onto the train. Um, so I don't think that's the best experience for the user. Somebody who can't do the stairs is not gonna have the same experience getting on the green line that I will, okay? And this is an example of what we have to do to retrofit things, right? 
The green line is, I think, more than 100 years old. And the trains, I think, might be about that old. And um, there was no way to make all of those trains accessible to people who couldn't do stairs. And this is what they came up with. And I think we do this sometimes with websites, right? When we have to, we've built a website, there's a piece of it that's not accessible, and we have to retrofit it. And then the retrofit isn't really the best experience. Um, but it's the best we could do given what we have to work with. And it's really the result of maybe not thinking about accessibility at the outset. Um, this is an example of two printers in a university setting. And you can see the two printers are at different levels. One's at a high level, one's at a low level. People come up, they choose which printer they want to use. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there are no labels. You know. Certain groups use this one, certain groups use this one. I have a coworker, so I'm not very tall. I really like the lower printer. I can see the screen. It works really well for me. I have a coworker who's very tall. He hates the lower printer because he has to bend over and it's inconvenient for him. This is what we would call equivalent use. And this works pretty well as long as we keep both printers up all the time, okay? We don't want to have the second printer running out of paper, running out of toner, so that it's not available to people who want it. What's nice about this, people get to choose what they want to use. Um, and we've seen this occasionally on the web, right, where we have an equivalent website. Um, have you seen websites that are text-only web versions of a website? Or sometimes it's actually labeled the accessible version of the website. And that works. Um, it doesn't work as well as this, however, because um, sometimes the accessible version isn't kept up as well. Um, it doesn't have all the information that the general uh, website has, and it's not the same user experience. Whereas this version of equivalent use is really giving a user the same experience. Um, this is a multimodal fire alarm. And this one is sort of interesting. So fire alarms used to be sound only. They were a big bell. And that worked pretty well, except if you couldn't hear. And so eventually, they came out with this multimodal fire alarm that has a big strobe light on it in addition to the loud sound. Now, all of us would agree that that's probably a great idea, because you're getting the information in two ways. If there's a real emergency, you want to know as many ways as possible that there's an emergency and you need to get out of the building. The story about this fire alarm is that I shared an office with someone who was deaf. And we had this in our office. But these fire alarms were not anywhere else. This was about 20 years ago. Um, so if she wasn't in our office and there was an emergency, I'm not sure how she was going to get the word. But in our office, this is what we had. And when our office moved, they had to move the fire alarm. And it was a big process to get the fire alarm moved because it was our special fire alarm. Now you see these everywhere. These are standard, right? Because it just makes more sense for, you can see right over there, everybody to have the loud sound, the loud, um, and the strobe light so that everybody knows what's going on. So this is another example of sort of multimodal approach to accessibility. We're giving information in different ways, and people can take advantage of it, however works for them. Um, and I think the equivalent on the web for this would be something like captions, because we can see the captions. Many of us use captions in addition to listening to the audio. But some people who have hearing disabilities can't, can't use the audio. And so they rely in, entirely on the captions. Now this, coincidentally, is the building right next door. This is MIT's Sloan School of Management. It opened, I think, just about a year and a half ago. Um, it was a new building that MIT built. And you can see that the entryway to the building has this nice, gently sloping entrance. Um, and it works for all kinds of people using all kinds of conveyances to get into the building. Um, there's no separate ramp, no separate space, no separate entrance. Uh, it's, it, it's really lovely. The building itself is beautiful. What's nice is it was a new building, and they had time to think about accessibility from the beginning and think about the best way to approach it. 
And this is an example of what we call universal design because it works for everyone. Um, and sometimes on the web, if we can think about accessibility at the outset, we have a much better chance of getting something that looks like this that everyone can use as opposed to something that we have to retrofit like the green line lift. So that's sort of my entry to the um, to accessibility in general. And now I want to move on to talk a little bit about um, users. Um, I wanted to show you all a picture of a diverse group of people, ages, um, abilities. It doesn't really exist out there on the web. I had a really hard time finding pictures. And this was almost the best I could come up with, um, which is a big diverse group of people. Because our users are a diverse group of people. They have all kinds of abilities. Um, ages, you know, there's an incredible range of uh, users age-wise. And I think we need to remember that. Sometimes when we're developing websites, we get caught a little bit with some tunnel vision where we're thinking about one kind of user and we forget that there's a range out there. And I think that that's really important. Um, now, I will just go through um, basic types of disability that we focus on when we talk about accessibility. Um, and I think the Census Bureau says that one in five people have a disability. I think it's 20% of the United States population. Um, the interesting thing about that number is they don't really count, they don't count people like me who wear glasses, right? I don't really think of myself as having a disability, but there's a whole bunch of things that I can't see on the web unless I use these. Um, so it's actually a large number of people that can't take in information perfectly, okay? And I, I use that sort of, I hesitate to use that word, but um, that are going to have some difficulty taking in information. So the first thing I want to talk about um, is just the range of the different disabilities that we see. In terms of vision, um, sometimes we tend to think about users as um, blind users only, but there's an incredible range of vision loss among people. And they range from completely blind to people with limited vision. And that can result in not being able to see a screen at all. It can result in seeing only a portion of the screen, maybe the center of the screen, maybe the edges of the screen. It can result in people having low vision um, where they need things blown up so big that they're using a screen magnifier to see the screen. Um, it could also include people who are colorblind and see different shades of um, colors differently than the rest of the population. In terms of hearing, um, there's also a range in hearing loss from total deafness to hard of hearing and people who use hearing assistance. Um, there are also motor disabilities to think about, and those also cover a wide range of users. Um, and in terms of computer use, we tend to think of people who either use a different type of pointing device because they have limited use of their arms or hands. Um, there are people who use keyboard only. Um, and then there are people who use alternative pointing devices. And so we need to keep those types of disabilities in mind. There are also people who have um, motor disabilities and they have a hard time reaching a target on the screen because of their motor disability. I'm thinking of people with things like Parkinson's disease. Um, and it makes it very difficult to hit a very narrow target um, with a mouse. So those are the sorts of things we want to keep in mind. The largest group of um, disabilities actually are cognitive and learning disabilities. That's the fourth group. Um, we don't know a lot about this group and how they use the web, actually. I think folks are just starting to do research on this now. Um, but this is a large group of, of people. And typically, the issues that we see are um, issues with content that's moving on the screen in the background, autoplay, um, things that the user can't control that are moving and are very distracting, overwhelming content. Um, and those sorts of issues are, are really 
difficult for people with cognitive and learning disabilities. Um, I also want to say a word about um, temporary versus permanent disabilities. I think we forget that many of us will, at some point in our life, face some sort of temporary disability, whether we fall and break an arm, whether we have surgery on our eyes. What, um, it happens all the time, and I think our world requires us to get right back to work these days. Um, I've had coworkers who break an arm skiing, and they come back to work, but for three or four months, they can't use a keyboard, and they can't use a mouse, and they have to rely on voice recognition software, okay? And they need to be able to do their job. So I think that those are, are also some disabilities that aren't counted in that one in five, but are important. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about assistive technology. Um, assistive technology, again, a huge range used by different groups of people. Um, oops. Um, the first thing I want to point out, glasses. We don't think of this as assistive technology, but it certainly is. Um, I know Danny's fa famous for saying that. And um, I couldn't sign in downstairs today until I put my glasses on. This is a really important piece of equipment for me, and it's an important piece of equipment for a lot of people to be able to access technology. I keep hitting the wrong button. Okay, um, this is a trackball. It's an alternative pointing device for people who don't want to use a traditional mouse. You see this a lot um, for people who have repetitive stress injuries and can't use a typical mouse. Um, it leads to some differences in how they click on information and how many clicks they're willing to, um, to execute. Because the people who use trackballs typically don't want to be constantly clicking on something. Um, alternative keyboards are a great assistive device. And there are also people who use the keyboard only. Um, they're not able to use a mouse at all because of maybe a, a motor issue or maybe a vision issue. If, um, if you have a vision issue, and particularly if you're blind and using a screen reader, you don't use a mouse at all because you can't see where it is on the screen. This is a headset from um, voice recognition software. I'm thinking of Dragon, naturally speaking. Um, you see this in a lot of folks who have some sort of repetitive strain injury or a motor disability and they can't use a mouse or a keyboard at all. Um, they're using voice recognition to activate um, everything on the screen and to type. This is um, a very small hearing aid um, representing the assistive devices that folks use who have some sort of hearing loss. This is a screenshot of Zoom text which is a screen magnifier. A lot of people who have very limited vision will use a screen magnifier to blow up the screen so they can see the text very large on the screen. Um, they also may use this to reverse the contrast on a screen. Um, and it's, it has a lot of functionality, but there are some issues in browsing the web that come up with users of Zoom text. Um, JAWS is um, the most popular screen reader out there. Screen reader software will read um, the entire screen to a user. Um, it's usually for people who are blind or have very limited vision. There are a number of other screen readers out there now. JAWS used to be the only screen reader. Um, now there are free screen readers available, including NVDA for Windows. Um, JAWS only works on Windows. And I see a lot of Macintosh computers out there, and VoiceOver comes built in with Macs, and we're seeing a lot more users um, use VoiceOver these days. So, and we're gonna, I'm gonna try to demo a screen reader a little bit later so you can see how it works with the web. This is a refreshable Braille display. It's another piece of assistive technology that will attach to a device, and instead of being read the content, um, through headphones, the, the user will actually be able to feel the content um, in Braille, and it will refresh as the computer is reading additional content. So it's one line, um, and they can get content that way. And finally, an iPhone. Um, a lot of people are using phones as assistive devices now. Um, you'll see people who want to use the mobile version of a website because it's easier to use, and they'll use their phone. Um, 
lots of people are using Siri and VoiceOver on their phones. Do people here use Siri frequently? Do we have a lot of Siri? Okay, a few. Um, I've seen teenagers use phones and they don't type at all. They talk to the phone all the time and make the phone do the typing for them. Um, and it's interesting to see how popular Siri is with them. The great thing about the iPhone, you know, when, when the iPhone first came out, it was not accessible at all. It had a touch screen. You really had to be able to see it to use it. And for a variety of reasons, Apple went back and reworked it. And they came out with something that's actually pretty accessible. And I know a lot of people who have a visual disability who say, I used to have to buy all of this equipment for my daily work. You know, I needed things that would read text to me. I needed things, I needed a special phone that would call. I needed a special watch. And I was able to replace all of them with this. And what was really nice about this is I bought it just like you did. It came in the mail or I brought it home from the store. I opened the box, I turned it on and it works. And if I have a problem with it, I can ask you to fix it. Whereas with all my old equipment, I had to ship it back. It was very expensive. And this I can use just like everybody else. It's a broader user experience. So it's not without its challenges, but I think it's worth mentioning that this is a very popular um, assistive technology device these days. So now we're gonna talk about standards. And um, I have to say, this is how I feel whenever I think about WCAG 2.0, which is the, um, the main standard that we follow for accessibility. I mean, does anybody else feel this way when they have to think about accessibility and how to deal with the, the standards? It feels to me like a giant maze that I've got to get through and it's almost like um, somebody said to me earlier, the steps at Harry Potter and in Hogwarts at Harry Potter where they're moving all the time. So you figure out the maze and you know how to get to the other side and then you try to do it again and you can't repeat it. And it's, it's extremely frustrating. So I'm going to try to dive into these WCAG standards a little bit and show you a little bit about how to apply them and how to evaluate for them as we look at websites. Um, so just some background on WCAG 2.0. Um, it was finalized in 2008. It's the second version of the technology, um, the accessibility standards from the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, they're a huge improvement over the 1.0 version. These are technology agnostic, which is wonderful. And they basically operate, um, they are four guiding principles and then each guiding principle has success criteria off of them, okay? Now I know that sounds simple enough as we get started. Once you get into the success criteria, things get very confusing. Um, they also, these success criteria, I should say, have three levels of compliance, single A, double A, and triple A, um, where uh, AAA is the most, um, let's see, what was the word I wanted to use? The highest level of compliance and double, um, single A is the, the lowest level. You see most people say they want to be double A compliant with WCAG 2.0. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the first thing I want people to understand about these standards is they are not pass fail. They really are a continuum. Um, they're constantly changing and there is really no such thing as being 100% compliant all of the time. Um, accessibility, I saw um, Jared Smith gave a presentation recently. He's from um, Web Accessibility in Mind at Utah State University and he said um, that, you know, accessibility is really something we can always improve on. Right, it's something we can always work on and always improve on and it's a continuum. So I'd like you to keep that in mind as we move forward. So here are four guidelines. Perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And what we need to remember here is that these are guidelines, they spell the word poor, so they're often known as the poor principles. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that acronym, but um, we, can, we can work with it. Um, 
In terms of using the guidelines, we always need to remember that at the end of the day, a user is trying to do something. So we can be compliant with the guidelines, but still have a website that's inaccessible, okay? Um, and I think that's really important to keep in mind. I can't stress that enough. And I have looked at you know, registration processes for different things, and um, I work with a screen reader user, and he'll call me laughing and say, you know that registration process is coded beautifully. It's perfect. He said, but you still can't register. No one can. It's not usable. And you know that does happen all the time, and we need to remember that usability is a big part of this. Now, accessibility does amplify usability issues. If I encounter a difficult issue on a site, um, someone who's a screen reader user might be stopped by that issue, okay? So there, there are, um, it, it is worse um, on the accessibility side. Um, there are some good tools out there to help you understand this. We're gonna be looking at the Web AIM um, toolbar, and Web AIM stands for Web Accessibility in Mind. I mentioned it earlier, from, it's from Utah State University. They do a very nice job of interpreting these guidelines. Um, I think that their tool is very useful, it's free, um, and their guidelines and their checklist are, are very good and easy to use. Um, what we're gonna do today actually is, I've picked out a site for the, um, the Field Museum in Chicago. It's the Natural History Museum in Chicago. It's a Drupal site, and I thought that we would use that as we walk through some of these examples today. Um, so we'd have some sort of consist a consistent reference point. So let's talk first of all about the first guideline, perceivable. So it's pretty straightforward, right? WCAG tells us that um, perceivable means that information and user interface components must be presentable to users in ways they can perceive. What that means is you have to be able to take in the information using your senses. Primarily, that affects people who have limited vision and people who have limited hearing, okay? Um, this is probably gonna be the principle that we spend the most time on. Um, if you think about the web, when the web started, it was purely a visual medium, right? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how users who couldn't see it were going to access it, how we were gonna get that content to them in an auditory way so they could take it in. Um, the web has become a multimedia place now, so we need to think a little bit about people who can't hear the content and how we need to get that content to them. But we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about perceivable, the perceivable principle here. So this is the, um, the Field Museum site, and I'm gonna try here to just go over to, okay, so you can see this on the web. Um, nope. My resolution isn't as good as I would like it to be. And um, unfortunately, it's showing the mobile version of the menu over here. Um, what you would typically see is a big menu on the left um, and this page of a lot of different photos um, showing different aspects of the Field Museum. And I'm gonna go back actually to this version um, because here you can see the, the full desktop version that I was talking about. Um, so all of us here who can see the screen can make some sense out of this page by looking at it, right? We can look at this and say, okay, clearly there's some navigation on the left. Um, it looks like there's some photos here. There's a search box. And we can get a hierarchy of this page visually by looking at it. The challenge is thinking about how to convey all of that information to a user um, who can't see the information. Um, I'm actually, I'm gonna back up here because I think this is an easier perceivable issue. Um, I'm gonna talk about, uh, they have video on the site. 
and I don't know that you can see it right here, but they have a lot of video on the site. And I wanted to just show this to you. Um, some of their video is captioned. But I'm gonna turn the sound off here and then we can play this video and you can see what it's like to watch this video with no sound. and no captions. So I won't make you watch the whole thing. But um, so does that give you a sense of what, it, what it's like? I mean, did you get anything out of that video from the few seconds that we watched without audio? Yes. You did? Yeah. What'd you get? So it's actually about their virtual visits to the museum and the different things you can do if you can't make it to the museum. So you're right, you got something about the museum out of it, but it's very hard to get a lot out of it if you can't hear the content. Yeah, I feel like it's when they zoomed in on like TV sets and people talking, like I'm never seeing that. <laughs> right, um, so I think that's, let's go back here to our slides. Um, so, you know, adding captions to that would make it accessible. We could, we could watch the video and we could take in what people were saying. We would see the words um, and that would be a much better experience. We'd have a better idea of what was going on at the Field Museum. Um, captions, you know, used to be pretty difficult to do. They've gotten a lot easier. There are companies that do captioning. Um, and we're seeing captions more places. I've seen captions on um, Facebook videos recently, which is really nice um, and I think has made a big difference for a lot of people because, you know, I have a deaf friend who would get really frustrated and say, there's all this great content, none of it's captioned, so I can't enjoy any of it. And that's a really frustrating experience for me. Um, and you don't want people to walk away from something like the Field Museum, which is this great museum, and people want to come to your site to find out about how to go visit and what you have to offer. And you don't want them to leave feeling like they don't want me to visit. Okay, so captions are something that are really easy to test for. Okay, we just did our caption test. We looked at the video. There's no caption. Typically, you would see a closed caption symbol here on the lower right-hand side of the screen. There are no captions. Um, and so that's, that's difficult. Now, they have other video on the site that is captioned, okay? So sometimes things do get left out. Um, there are lots of organizations out there that have a lot of old video that they have on their site and it's really hard to go and caption the backlog of it, but it would be a great thing to caption video moving forward. Um, so now I wanna talk about the text and I, I sort of jumped ahead of myself there. Um, but we can see on the screen visually we can make sense of, this, of the screen and we get the hierarchy, right? We see what the different navigation items are. We can see that there are two main sections, you know, science at the field and events at the field. And then within those, there look to be some subsections. And we're getting that all visually, right? And building this mental model of it, which is very difficult to do if you're having the entire site read to you by a screen reader because a screen reader is a machine and it's gonna to read to you linearly from the top of the code to the bottom of the code, okay? So the machine needs a way to tell the user, there are some headings here, there are some links here, there's some pictures here, and then that user can build a mental model. So I'm gonna to try to, um, I'm gonna to try to go to the site and turn on the screen reader and see if we can. I just wanna play a little bit of voiceover for you and see if you can hear. Um, and I'm, let's see. Now, I'm gonna, I'm listening, by the way, I have my screen reader set very slowly. 
um, because I don't listen that quickly. And I do want to say I am not a screen reader user, and there is no way that me as a sighted person can use a screen reader in the same way as a person who can't see the screen. But it is a good way to test out a site and see what kind of issues a screen reader might encounter. Okay. Um, now I will tab through the site here and we can see what we're going to find. So now that tells me that there's a menu and then it tells me what the menu items are. Um, Now, unfortunately, it was skipping over some of those main menu links, and it may go to them. So. Um, so as you can see, we tabbed through some things at the bottom. And as a visual user, I thought I had skipped the ones at the top, but they're just in a different order. Um, that's also a little bit of an issue for screen reader users. They want every, everything should be in the same order that it's in on the page um, because they'll think that they have missed the menu. Okay, it's very frustrating to be going through a site looking for some information and then finding out that it was, the menu's at the bottom of the page. None of us expect that menu to be at the bottom of the page. Um, and so that can be a little bit frustrating. Um, I am gonna... On desktop, those, those items are yeah. actually... They, yes, they are, and you're absolutely right. On desktop, they go through in a much better order. Exactly, and th that's a great catch. <laughs> um, I want to just show you one other thing here. There is, um, let's see. Oh, I'm going to have to go back. Well, of course, the technology is failing me right now. It's not cooperating, but pardon me? Um, let's see if we can do this. No. Um, what I wanted to show you is I'm going to turn my screen reader off now. Oh, I think my screen reader has frozen. Okay. Um, so we're just going to go back to the presentation, unless my, I might have to. Okay. Okay, so see, it's permanently on our screen there. You know what, I'm going to exit the slideshow and see if I can. It really doesn't want to let me turn that screen reader off. Oh dear. Yeah, exactly. All right, okay. So this is not helping me here, my screen reader. So, so I'm amazed that people who use screen readers every day don't take their computers and throw them against the wall. Because this is the frustration, right? And I can see everything on the screen. And I'm still having a hard time making it work, and then it crashes. Okay? And this is a consistent experience for those users, right? And that's really frustrating. I mean, I have a coworker who uses a screen reader, and he has the patience of Job because this happens to him, and he'll say, oh, yeah, it just died. Oh, well, I'll have to start over again. Um, and this is supremely frustrating. I mean, I might even have to restart my machine. Let's see if we can. What screen reader is that? Is this is VoiceOver. This is the one built into the Mac. Um, There's some great, let's see. If you want to start your machine, I can ask you questions. Okay. I think I'm going to restart my machine. So I'm happy to take questions while I restart my machine. So one of the questions I have is, um, 
questions that I have that I've gotten um, that, that I've gotten when I've talked about the need for accessibility is the sort of assumption that you know nobody visits our site with a screen reader or like this challenge. Like, do you know how many people are visiting our site? Do you have analytics on how many people are visiting our site using a screen reader? Which is usually when I pull out the line about glasses being assistive technology and telling them, and tell them that red text on a gray background is never a good idea. Um, what are the answers that you typically give when you get questions like that? So, uh, you know, I hear that question all the time. How many users have? How many users use? And what I typically say is it doesn't matter because you don't know, oh my, I'm getting, I'm getting an ugly screen here. Oof. Um, this has to happen in the Nerd Center, right? Like I'm in a Microsoft building, so <laughs> they know I'm on a Mac. Um, <laughs> no, so what I typically say is, you know, maybe we have one user today, but we don't know who's coming through the door tomorrow. Um, and you really don't know, not all users identify themselves. Right? I mean, I don't tell everybody that I wear glasses. People don't necessarily share that information. Your users don't really want to share that information. Um, and it doesn't really matter. The other thing, the other answer is that all of the things that we're talking about really do benefit all users. You know, we've talked about captions and how um, they have shown tremendous promise for um, learning. Right, because people can watch a video and see the caption at the same time. And that's a great way to take in information if you can take in information in both ways. Um, you can see the text. Um, it's incredibly helpful for people who don't speak um, English as a first language if the video is in English, because it's a great way to see the words and hear the words. Um, and I think we can't know, uh, there are tremendous benefits from good coding practices that benefit screen reader users. You know, we, we all know that SEO optimization and better code, cleaner code, fewer updates, less costly updates are part of that. Um, but I think Apple had no idea how many people who are blind would want to use the iPhone. And it became a tremendous thing for them. And, and what's great is sometimes you see the commercials for Apple and they're using, they have people who don't see who are using the voice, um, the voiceover on their phones, and it's great that they're just a regular part of their user group. So does that answer your question a little bit? While we're uh, waiting for you to get back up and running here, I just wanted to mention the, the Facebook example I think is a really interesting one. Sadly, I don't think they did it for accessibility, but I love it because I like to be able to keep my sound off while I'm seeing stuff um oh boy exactly yeah, yeah. Yep. so um i think that's an example of doing something that will make your site better for everyone not just your regular users or your users that need the the accessible features but it's you never know what kind of feature will get used by who and why so it's nice to keep things as uh, multimodal as possible exactly and i think that's an excellent I think that's an excellent point. And you're right, I don't think Facebook did it for those reasons. It wasn't actually Facebook. It's the fact that Facebook started auto-playing videos. The yeah. user auto-playing videos with no audio on them. So yeah. content producers basically were like, we're, show, we're showing this video content that nobody, like nobody's actually you know, clicking on the audio. Mm -hmm. So we give them text to read. And so it just speeds up what we're talking about. Yeah, was it, a, was it advertisers who drove that? I don't know who I don't know who drove it, but I just I just know that the, you know, the when they started playing auto playing videos with no audio, basically, is when people started figuring out that content producers started figuring out they need to put they need to put subtitles on there. Or in some cases, it's not subtitles. It's like it's the main content of like some of them turn on audio and there's no audio. Right. It's, it's just pictures and words. I've seen that. I've that seen that. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, and um, Yahoo recently started captioning movie trailers um, because movie trailers were never captioned. 
um, which is something I, I wouldn't have thought of, but watching movie trailers has become a big thing, right? And all of these people who needed captions were saying, none of the captions are, the, none of the captions are there for trailers and we're missing out on all this. Um, and so Yahoo started captioning movie trailers and it's great, you can go to their site and pick up um, all of these different uh, movie trailers and see the captions with them. And it's only on Yahoo. I think it's set up so that it only works if you play it on their news site. Um, Yahoo has a large accessibility lab um, in California and a small accessibility lab here in Boston. Um, so since our screen reader is not cooperating, I'm not gonna turn that back on just yet. Um, what I was gonna show you is that there's a way to turn on in the screen reader in VoiceOver um, a setting, uh, an option, where it will show you all the links on the page, all the headings on the page, all the form controls on the page. And it's great for a screen reader user to be able to look at that and say, oh, here's a really long list of links. Um, and here's what they are. And then they can look at the heading structure and they can say, oh, here's the main heading, here are the um, subheadings. That looks like it has a couple subheadings. This one has a couple subheadings. And then you can see that they're moving on to getting this mental model of the site that we got from looking at this page and scanning it, okay? So the heading structure, the link structure is all incredibly important for providing that mental model. Um, So we did our demo. Um, a couple things I wanted to say about the text on the page and headings and links. Um, when you tab through using a screen reader, and this is true for any screen reader, you navigate typically by tabbing through. And when you tab through, you're not tabbing to every word. You're tabbing to focusable elements on the page. Okay, so those are things like links, headings, um, buttons, form controls, okay? So like on this page, the screen reader, if I can get my mouse up, would not read the hours here initially. Now you could go to that content and get that, but if you were navigating by links or just tabbing through, it would skip that piece of information. Is that clear to folks how that's working? So focus is a really important um, element when we're talking about perceivability and accessibility because the elements have to be focusable for a screen reader user to get them. Um, what are some other things? We talked about the order. Um, yes? That's a great question. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's really important. Can you repeat it for the report? Yes. Um, so how important is it to display the outline around the focusable element? That in Chrome, it's I think a blue outline. Um, that's a browser, um, it's a browser feature, but you can turn it off in CSS, correct? And um, it's really important because, so if I'm a, if I'm a screen reader user, um, and I'll try to show you this a little bit later, when I tab through, it's gonna highlight every element on the page that I'm tabbing to, so I'm gonna know where that is. If I'm using a mouse to access this page, it's going to highlight everything that I hover over, okay, so I know where I am. On this particular page, this example that we're looking at, if I tab through it on Chrome, I don't get the visual focus. So I have to kind of guess where I am, I have to look at the bottom to see where I am. Um, it does highlight a few things, but for a keyboard only user, that's a real problem because I don't necessarily know where I am and where I'm going. Are you talking about primarily for uh, people not using visually impaired people? Or right. For people who have some ability to have some, to, you know, to see that blue outline. Exactly, to see that. Maybe not enough to read all the words. Exactly, or, um, or it's really important for, it gets to our next principle, which is operability. Um, for people who are keyboard only users who can probably see the screen, um, they need to know where they are on the page. And if I'm using a mouse, I do that and I hover over things and it tells me where I can see my mouse and I see where it is. But if I'm just tabbing through, um, I don't necessarily know what I've landed on unless I see that nice outline. 
Okay, does that make sense? Um, okay, so um, in terms of perceivability, so we've talked about um, building, so it's basically building good structure on the page and following the heading structure, using headings, um, is really important because sometimes screen reader users um, will navigate by headings. I think the last survey that WebAIM did of um, screen reader users, the feedback was overwhelmingly that they navigate by headings. So they're looking at headings on the page, they're looking for those headings. And there are all sorts of shortcuts in the screen readers that will allow you to just jump from heading to heading. Okay? So it's really important. It's really important that those headings are clear. Okay, this gets into our content. We want the headings to be clear and descriptive and help you to build that mental model. Um, the same is true for links because you can also navigate link to link to link. And what's really frustrating for any sort of screen reader user is to hit a bunch of links that say, click here or read more or more because their list of links is going to come up and it's just going to say more, 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 more. And it gives them no context as to what they're getting more of. So if you could have a descriptive link that said, you know, more about virtual visits or more about something, that would be really helpful um, because otherwise it's just a link and they don't know where it's going to go. Okay. Um, the last thing that I want to say about um, perceivability has to do with forms um, because forms are another big issue. And I think, um, I'm going to go back. We're going to talk about forms a little bit later because it's an operability issue as well. But um, we've all seen the forms, right? And we have a list on typically the left and it'll say first name, last name, email address, um, title, et cetera, and then there are the, the form boxes, right? And we all look at them visually, and I think I have actually an example of this. Um, I'll, go, I'll go back to it in a minute, but um, we can all see the form visually, but if you can't see the labels, you don't know what the boxes are for. And we're going to look at an example here for signing up for a membership to the Field Museum where the, um, the form just reads a blank box, blank text field. And so as a screen reader user, you don't know if that blank text field is name or email address or address or city or state because it just reads blank field over and over again. Okay, so it's really important to um, associate those fields with form labels so that your users know what they're looking at. It's also really important for users of screen magnification software um, because if you, have, um, if you have form labels and fields that are very far apart, it's really hard to see when you've magnified the screen considerably. You don't really know what you're looking at. So. Um, so that's in terms of text. There are a lot of rules um, to think about in terms of the perceivability of text. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the content is organized well. You want to use a logical heading structure and semantic structure. Um, my understanding is that Drupal supports HTML5, um, which is really nice, and those semantic labels are very helpful to screen reader users. Um, you want your headings to be clear, and you want your links to be clear, and you want form labels to be associated with form controls so that folks can fill out your form. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about images because that used to be the thing that we talked about the most when we talked about accessibility and visual accessibility. Images on a site um, need to have alternative text, alt text. So is everybody here familiar with alt text? Because it's, it's pretty common. Um, the problem with alt text is that a lot of images don't need alt text, okay? Um, if the image is a link to something else, you might not really need alt text on the image because you're already describing what the image is gonna do in your um, link text, okay? 
So um, it's interesting. So they have this image on the field site has alt text of three boys smiling in the ancient Egypt exhibition. It's fine alt text. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. But the other images on the page, they've used null alt text um, because it's just a link to something else. So we could probably spend an hour and a half talking about alt text and the best way to employ it. Um, it is a little bit more art than science. Um, and WebAIM has a particularly good article about alt text and how best to use it. Um, but the most important thing to remember is if you're not, if you don't want a user to have to read the image, if they don't need to know that this is three boys smiling at the ancient Egypt exhibition, you can use the null alt text, which is two quotation marks with a space in between. And then the screen reader user will skip that, okay? And um, so these are some other images from the page. And you can see here, the, these images actually do not have alt text because the captions really do cover it. And the link text describes what that link is taking you to, OK? Um, so now we're going to talk about color, which is also another thing that we've talked a lot about um, in accessibility. We talk a lot about color contrast issues. Um, and this is a place where WCAG is very clear about what the um, contrast ratio should be. And it's very easy to measure. There are a number of free tools out there that will help you measure contrast. Um, and I did a quick test on this, the field site. And I found that this green text worked pretty well for large headings, but it really was, did not meet the ratio for small text, like down here. Um, so I, I thought that was interesting. This is very easy to test for, and there are a lot of tools out there that will help you correct um, for color contrast and choose a color that will meet the contrast guidelines. Um, so I don't know that we need to spend um, too much time on on this, um, and I think, I think here's my form example that I was looking for. Um, I'll take you back at, at the end if we have time and we can go through the form, but literally each of these form fields just reads as um, a blank, a blank uh, unlabeled field. And I don't know how anybody would fill out this form to sign up for a membership to the Field Museum. Um, if they had to use uh, this form with a screen reader. So they wouldn't, is that what you said? Yeah, if they wanted to sign up, they'd probably go to the Field Museum and do it there, right? Call them on the phone, that's great. And, and again, that's not the same user experience because if I'm doing this at midnight, I can't call them on the phone and I can't take care of it. Pardon me? <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. Okay, so we've talked about perceivable and we've spent a considerable amount of time for that and I apologize for the technical difficulties with the screen reader. Um, but now we want to talk about operable, right, which is our second uh, guiding principle. And basically WCAG says the user interface components and navigation must be operable. You have to be able to use the site and interact with the elements on the site. Um, and typically, when we think of operable, you know, like when we think of perceivable, I think the first thing that comes into everybody's mind is alt text and color contrast. And there's a lot more to perceivable that includes text. Um, for operable, what we think about is keyboard only access, right? Being able to get to all of the elements just using the keyboard. Um, and it's pretty easy to test for, you know, you just don't use your mouse and you can try tabbing through a site and see if you can get to all the elements. Um, and, you know, operability is an issue for people who use voice recognition software. It's an issue for people who use um, alternative pointing devices somewhat, like if they're using a certain kind of trackball. Um, but it's really about keyboard only use. Um, the biggest problem with operability that we see is um, pop-up dialog boxes. 
because focus sometimes doesn't shift to the pop-up box. So um, it's very difficult to get to that pop-up box if you're not using a mouse. Um, and that's the issue that's um, most troubling. Now, it's also difficult for a screen reader user who might know, not know that that pop-up box is there because it hasn't been announced to them, um, and so they can't get to it. Um, and sometimes you see a little bit of a trap with the pop-up box where focus has moved there and you can't get out of it. Um, you're sort of stuck in that trap. Um, so I think, um, so those are things to avoid. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Um, it, unless somebody, unless there's some announcement that this has happened, it can be very, that can be really tricky. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about order in our perceivable example, and it's pretty important for operability, just so you're not getting lost as you're going through the site. Um, you want, you want the focus to follow, you want the programmatic focus to follow the visual focus as closely as possible, okay? Um, so let's see. Now, I wanted to show, I'm gonna try the screen reader again, um, because there are a couple things that I really wanted to show you in terms of tabbing through the main page and tabbing through this form um, where you buy tickets to the museum. So this is an example of a page where you have to buy tickets to go to the museum. Um, we're gonna talk about it in terms of understandability as well, but in terms of operability, this presents some real challenges, okay? Um, because you have to be able to tab through all of these items and it's not clear what they all are. So let's see if we can get the screen reader to Cooperate. Yes. Oh, okay. That's so funny. I never run long. <laughs> All right. So here we'll go back. Um, but just know that that is a real challenge in terms of um, because what happens here is <laughs> you never know what you're really buying tickets for. Um, so this is, this is a really challenging form. Understandable is sort of in my wheelhouse. The understandable principle is all about usability. Um, information and the operation of user interface must be understandable. Um, this really gets to the idea of what your content looks like and is it clear, you know, or is the writing appropriate? Um, this is the broadest category in the WCAG guidelines, I think. And um, you wanna make sure that there are minimal distractions. Um, and I think the form that we just looked at in terms of buying tickets, this is really difficult to understand um, because you've just got a lot of things repeated over and over again. Um, the fourth category is robust. Um, and this, you know, content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies. Um, this really means that you want to make sure that your site is going to work on the technology your users use. Um, it used to be an issue a while ago when people were on different browsers and we had browser compatibility issues. It seems to not be as big an issue anymore. Um, I think for me the issue is, um, does it work on mobile? because a lot of people are using mobile, and how does it, how's the mobile experience? Um, okay. um, I wanted to talk briefly about um, automated evaluation and evaluating accessibility. Um, and this is an example of using the WAVE toolbar that I mentioned um, to look at accessibility. Um, the WAVE tool toolbar is a Chrome extension, it's free. And what's so nice about this tool is that it will allow you to choose um, under filter, you can choose compliance level, WCAG A, um, AAA or AA. 
Um, it'll show you the errors here, and you can click on those, and it will take you to the errors on the page. Um, and it will explain sort of what the errors are and um, a little bit about how you should address them. It also shows features that your site has, so places where there is alt text, places where HTML5 and ARIA are used. It will show you that, and that can be really helpful. This is in no way a substitute for um, real testing. Um, it's not a substitute for a human going through and trying to tab through the site. But it is a great way to get started and see where you are with accessibility. Okay? Um, so I highly recommend the tool. There are other free tools out there that are great to use as well. Sometimes I use multiple tools and sort of compare the results. And I find that to be really helpful. Um, when I ran this on that page for buying tickets, um, it was interesting because there were like 179 errors on the page um, because there were no form labels at all. So no one knew what they were buying. Um, <laughs> well, and that's the hard thing because the Field Museum is a wonderful museum. And I'm sure a lot of people do want to buy tickets and go there and, and it's a difficult process. Um, I wanted to say a few words about Drupal and accessibility. Um, it's a really great thing that Drupal has this real commitment to accessibility, um, starting with Drupal 7 and continuing with Drupal 8. Um, all of these things that we've talked about, Drupal supports. They support HTML5 and ARIA and good semantic markup and you know, good form labeling. Um, all of those things are there to make those sites accessible. Um, there's also some really great resources out there, um, including the Drupal statement about accessibility, which is very helpful. And then there's a Drupal um, accessibility org um, organization, a group. I'm reading the URL. Um, and the accessibility group is great because people can ask questions. Um, I saw some great questions on there about using um, alt text and how to get null alt text to work. Um, and they have announcements there about Drupal camps coming up that are around accessibility. Um, so I think that's a really nice resource. Um, in terms of what's next for folks who are designers and developers, um, I just have some ideas here, some thoughts to kind of sum things up. In the design and development phase, it's really important to use colors with sufficient contrast. Don't use color alone as an indicator. You know, it's fine to make something red and bold as long as you have another way to tell people that it's important. Um, caption video, make transcripts available for audio, use alt text. Um, make sure your content is clear and organized. Um, use good semantic structure. Make sure the order is logical and follows the visual order. Um, and include labels with form elements. And then when you have something built and you're at the evaluation phase, um, I have a few ideas about evaluating for accessibility. I think the automated tools are really a great way to get started, but they don't tell you everything. Um, I, I, and I've seen some errors even on the WAVE toolbar where it tells me something has great alt text. I think it was on that ticket buying form, um, the little information icon had great alt text and the alt text was click here. So click here was repeated as alt text all the way down the page. Um, you should be able to check keyboard accessibility very easily, um, just using your keyboard and not using your mouse. I highly recommend using a screen reader. You're never going to be a screen reader user, but it's a great way to see what it's like to try to use a screen reader. Um, and I cannot say strongly enough, test with users. Um, bring in real users, have them test your site. Um, you want to make sure that you've cleaned up the big accessibility issues when you bring those users in. There's nothing more frustrating than bringing a user into the usability lab to test your site only to find out that they can't access anything. Um, so you definitely want to do some basic checking before you bring users in. And then catalog what you find. Um, I think it's really important to keep track of what you find. I work with Teams a lot, and we've had some good success using GitHub to actually track our issues, because we can all collaborate, we can ask questions, we can close things, and then we can go back to them later. 
When we encounter that same problem again, we can go back there and we can see how to fix it. Because so often we feel like we got through that maze and then we don't remember how we got there. And it's great if you can track that. So we've been using GitHub, but we've also had some you know, good success using Google Sheets. And it doesn't really matter as long as you have something that people can collaborate on um, and see those issues and prioritize them and get them fixed. This is just a list of the resources I want to send you home with. Um, WCAG, Drupal, WebAIM, and these very nice BBC accessibility guidelines where they have actually interpreted the guidelines, the WCAG guidelines, and spelled out what that actually means for them, for building things on their site. And I think it's really helpful that they've gone to that trouble to spell it out in excruciating detail. Um, so, um, I think we are all set. If you have questions, um, please contact me. I'm happy to talk to people. I love, obviously I'd love to talk ad nauseum about accessibility. Um, and so I'm happy to do that. Um, we can take a short round of questions now, too, with the group photo. Oh, you're going to take it. Um, yeah, and I can pass the mic around. Whatever. Um, we, um, we have time for maybe just a couple. I know we've had a bunch going through. Um, and then as soon as we're done with the photo, we're going to have to try and and move on into the next session. But um, before we go to the questions, just a round of applause. This is really, really oh, great. Thanks, Catherine. So I, I'm really just wondering, um, so in terms of, for example, registration pages with time, with time uh, time boxes like you only have X number of minutes to to register for the, for to work with this page. Has there been an established or good ballpark estimate of how long these processes are? Because the one that I know, what oh, what the Ontario College of Art and Design deploys is twenty minutes. But then when I when I signed up for when when I when I booked my flight, um, they only had ten minutes. So there doesn't seem to be. Uh, uh, an agreement as to what or or how long should a standard registration process could be? Um, I think that's a good question. Um, I haven't seen a standard. What I have seen is giving people the option to extend time. Um, so where they can say, hey, do you need more time to do this? So that the user has some control and can extend it. Um, but it's a good question. I don't know if there's a standard out there. Yeah, that's a good point. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just, um, so I think for, for a lot of small development jobs, please speak to my hand. Um, so I think for a lot of small development shops, I would say one of the limitations that I feel like we have is there isn't an easy way to test with real users who have disabilities. And there are so many different kinds of disabilities. Like, I guess I'm wondering if there's, if anybody has come up with a process for doing that where you don't, you know, you don't have to have a usability lab and you don't have to have a group of people uh, who you can test with. That's a good question as well. Um, there is a company called Loop 11 that I don't, I don't know if folks have heard about. It's an Australian company that does online um, unmoderated usability testing. And they partnered with Nobility in Texas to put to, together a panel of users with disabilities who would agree to be usability testers. It's not moderated testing, and there's a small, there's a fee associated with it, so it's not free. Um, but it would allow you, and their panel is not huge, um, but I would love to see that grow a little bit more because it would be nice if it worked really well to put up a test online, have a couple users try it out, and get some real feedback. Yeah, I mean, I think paying folks some money for it is fine. There's, there's also something worth noting. There's the Perkins School nearby that actually has done partnerships with some firms, actually with Fresh Tilled Soil, where I used to work where you can actually work with them to do some tests with 
with blind and other disabled users. Yeah, and there are also um, community groups that are willing to partner with organizations to do testing. Um, in Boston, there's a Vi it's a, the Vibug, the Visually Impaired and Blind Users Group, um, that is you know happy to have people um, ask them questions. And sometimes I know folks have gone to their meetings and said, hey, could we try this out? Um, so that's an option as well. So I think we've got time for one more, and I think we had somebody over here that needs. No, actually, I, I'll, I'll be after the last question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I think one more round of applause. I think we should wrap it up. Okay. I hope it was helpful. It was. Thank you.